There are many examples of role-playing games that take inspiration from literature, or can best be defined by the subgenre they wish to emulate. Call of Cthulhu has your Lovecraftian horror cover. Traveler has your classical hard sci-fi, and later editions of Dungeons and Dragons, the ones most approachable by society at large, in my opinion, cover very well the worlds of high fantasy, epic adventures to save the multiverse across a campaign-spanning arc that fills hundreds of pages in a module. Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition has become the gold standard of role-playing games in the modern era for its approachability, balanced gameplay, and tier-structured storytelling system, as well as countless other reasons. I played 5th edition, and I really enjoyed it. In fact, I don't have anything against it, but from the bowels of a dusty bookshelf in the RPG section of a local geek boutique, I made a discovery that changed the way I thought about role-playing games forever. Friends and enemies, I'm Judge Zed, a.k.a. Zacharias, the pious of House Lane, first of his name, former Lord of Give a Shit a Sheer, Harbinger of Sass, and Holy Prince of the Sea of Ash, and Lord of the Game, and today that game is telling you all about the only game whose maze craze plays for days in ways that will amaze days and set characters ablaze. I first thumbed through the unfathomable knowledge within the pages of the DCC rulebook, my mind was assailed by countless black and white illustrations that harkened back to the old edition rules that I had seen in my earliest days of playing the game. Warped forever was my spirit when I laid witness to the esoteric spell-casting rituals and required material to complete a dice chain twice the size of any I had ever imagined. I balked at the implication of seemingly impossible geometric shapes such as one with seven sides. As I felt my consciousness slipping and my vision began to tunnel, I ran from the store, all but shrieking to myself in horror, only to return after acquiring my next paycheck to purchase the tome without delay. This may be a bit of a dramatization, but my first moments with the game really were quite a revelation. I had never seen an RPG rulebook with such actionable information before. A focus on self-reliance and improvisation, with rules easy enough to follow to back it all up. It was classic but fresh, minimalist but had depth, introduced new things but kept everything that mattered to a fantasy role-playing game, and above all else, it encapsulated one of my favorite subgenres of fantasy, sword and sorcery. Sword and Sorcery began its life in the pages of Weird Tales with a short story by Conan the Barbarian creator Robert E. Howard entitled The Shadow Kingdom. From this short four-part story featuring Cole of Atlantis was born the literary subgenre of sword and sorcery, which I believe is best contrasted with high fantasy. While high fantasy is very concerned with good versus evil as well as a character's moral and physical development from childhood moving into adulthood, usually involving a big bad evil guy and his or her veritable or actual army of scary minions, Sword and Sorcery focuses on the microcosm the characters inhabit rather than the fate of the world at large. 
and its characters often live within some sort of ethical gray area as thieves or barbarians or adventurers. It has a lot of overlap and is sometimes referred to as heroic fantasy for this reason. So let's talk about what all of that means for the game mechanically. Without the high fantasy focus on good versus evil, your two-axis alignment system, synonymous with modern fantasy roleplaying, becomes a lot more simplified. Lawful, Neutral, and Chaotic are the three alignments available to players and game masters in Dungeon Crawl Classics. This system exemplifies my philosophy on good and evil perfectly. No one is just straight up evil, or at least they usually aren't just born that way. People make choices that are determined by society at large to be evil. Furthermore, someone may have the best intentions, but end up doing evil by accident. And even furthermore, there is the way that someone's material conditions can warp their perspective and cause them to become blinded to the far-reaching ethical implications of their own actions. Here's a pop culture example. Most people would agree that feeding innocent people to genetically modified dinosaurs is an act of evil. But, people would also probably agree that creating a theme park where the wonders of history are alive and available for all free of charge is a noble endeavor. Then that begs the question, is Jurassic Park's creator Dr. John Hammond an evil man? He did bring people to the island of dinosaurs he created and was in charge of, and those people were eaten by dinosaurs that he genetically modified with frog DNA, which allowed them to change their sex and mate with each other, creating an overrun nightmare island full of terrible lizards, which kills 16 men across the three original films and god knows how many in the reboot series because I haven't seen them yet and I don't like watching the kill counts of films I haven't seen yet. <sighs> that sounds an awful lot like an act of evil to me. But his intentions were at best idealistic and at worst extremely miscalculated. He's a man of science, so he's lawful in that sense. He followed the correct legal pathways to create his park. He had a lawyer on hand to help smooth anything out. And after the initial incident, he did his best to protect the park from further exploitation, failing in the attempt and putting more people in danger by doing so, but attempting nonetheless. So by applying these facts and actions to the two-axis alignment system, we may find ourselves arguing over whether Dr. John Hammond would be lawful evil, lawful good, or lawful neutral. And I feel like you could make a strong case for either of the three options, or any of the other options as well, because his intentions weren't necessarily evil, but the consequences could absolutely cause him to be seen in an evil light. And maybe as a venture capitalist, he's automatically lawful evil or lawful neutral. I honestly don't know. And this is a really hard question to even answer, and an even more difficult question to come up with a consensus on. This is why we see alignment charts with each space filled by the same character, or alignment charts with way too many spaces to even begin with. Our obsession with categorizing things and people in terms of good and evil is inherently flawed and even dangerous. I do my best to keep from reinforcing those beliefs at the table for reasons I will dive into deeper during a later segment. Because in reality, Dr. John Hammond isn't a good man or an evil man. He's just a man. He's a flawed man with several ethical faults, but he isn't entirely unforgivable or unrelatable. He's a human being, and that means having flaws. It means sometimes you are weak. And that is, above all else, what makes him a compelling character. In the Conan the Barbarian story, the god in the bowl, Conan the Sumerian, while attempting to rob a house of curiosities, is caught up in a police investigation as a couple bodies were just found inside the building Conan had planned to rob that very evening. He is outmatched in numbers, weaponry, and wits as he finds himself surrounded by the city's guards, who drill him mercilessly as part of their investigation. In the end, he escapes after committing a few beheadings in typical barbarian fashion, but that's not what makes this a good story. This story isn't interesting because Conan is able to quickly slice and dice his way out of another hairy situation. It's interesting because he can't at first. Conan isn't up against some unfathomable evil either, at least at first. He's up against Night Watchmen and an investigator just trying to do their jobs. 
He's also up against his own terrible luck and circumstances for being hired to rob this curiosity house on this very night. The fate of the city isn't at risk in this story, but the life and future of our protagonist is. The complex ethical implications are still at work here because everyone is just trying to do what they were hired to do, protect property or steal it. And it is this very conflict of interests and motivations that creates the intrigue of this story, and many of the stories of the sword and sorcery subgenre as a whole. But no one in the story is inherently good or evil. And they definitely aren't depicted as such. The original 1974 version of Dungeons and Dragons featured this same alignment system, lawful, neutral, and chaotic, inspired by the stories of Michael Moorcock and Paul Anderson. This lasted a short time until 1977 when the basic set of Dungeons and Dragons added the second axis. AD&D would continue this two axis system while basic would go back to the single axis system in 1983. Dungeon Crawl Classics is a game system that in its design wanted to above all else harken back to the classic early days of Dungeons and & Dragons, and to do so it chose not only to focus on the classic rules, but the literary inspiration cited by Gary Gygax in the original advanced Dungeons & Dragons Dungeon Master Guide. It is a list known as Appendix N, now famous in some circles and infamous in others, it has been reprinted in later editions, including an expanded version for the 5th edition, known now as Appendix E. The original list of authors and writers probably features some familiar names. J.R.R. Tolkien, Lynn Carter, H.P. Lovecraft, Edgar Rice Burroughs, L. Sprague de Camp, Lee Brackett, who went on to help with the screenplay for The Empire Strikes Back, Robert E. Howard, Michael Moorcock, Roger Zelazny, Jack Vance, just to name some of the more better-known authors, this pulptacular mishmash of literary inspirations is what gave early D&D its spark, and it's exactly where Dungeon Crawl Classics gets its spark as well. The reliance to focus on the original inspirations for the game served to not only allow for a game that feels inherently old-school to players familiar with older editions, but the modern reinterpretation of these literary inspirations into gameplay mechanics manages to feel entirely new to players of new editions, or players who have never played a fantasy role-playing before, but maybe have seen one played on their favorite streaming service. Some of my DCC players have moved on to 5th edition, but more of them have spun off and created their own DCC game, using whatever setting or alternative rules set appealed most to them within the growing family of DCC-compatible products. Dungeon Crawl Classics provides you with more than just a set of rules to refer to during a game of fantasy role-playing, but also a mechanical philosophy and framework for the creation of your own unique stories, setting, and rules. More importantly, it encourages you to do so, while also bringing something fresh and exciting to the table at every possible angle of attack. It's my favorite role-playing game, and I hope that this video series helps you to come to that conclusion as well. So, now that I have made you familiar with Dungeon Crawl Classics and its design philosophy, I would like to pose a question to you. What is the first thing people notice when you play RPGs in public, the first thing a new player buys when they are starting out in the hobby, and the second most important collection of an RPG gamer's arsenal after the rule books and the box sets? Find out next time on my currently untitled Dungeon Crawl Classics Deep Dive Mega Video. This is part one of a seven part series that I will probably combine into one video once the project is complete, uh, but so that my YouTube channel doesn't turn into a desert while I work on it, I will be releasing uh, each segment individually. If you enjoyed this video, consider donating to my Patreon to get access to an exclusive Discord channel where I chat about RPGs and host virtual meetups for like-minded gamers. If you still aren't sure what high fantasy or sword and sorcery are, here are some great literary examples to check out from your local library. For high fantasy, Lord of the Rings is the gold standard for many, but there are also many other examples. Basically, any, almost any series with the word Chronicles in the title is considered to be high fantasy. Uh, the Ferdane Chronicles, the Thomas Covenant Chronicles, the Chronicles of Narnia, 
Uh, and as far as RPGs go, you've got the ever-popular Dragonlance D&D setting uh, and its tie-in novels, as well as the Forgotten Realms setting and its tie-in novels. Two classic and beloved Dungeons & Dragons settings, uh, and arguably some of the most popular ones as well. For Sword and Sorcery, there's obviously Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian, but also Fafford of the Grey Mauser by Fritz Lieber, Elric of Melnibene by Michael Moorcock, Jirel of Joyry by C.L. Moore, Thieves' World, which is an anthology series by many writers, but it is much loved by many uh, and comes highly recommended. Thank you all so much for your support. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit that notification bell. Uh, it, it all really does mean a lot in the end to me, so uh, thank you all again once more.